Passport, but Tom had This spec session on optimization five. So I'm uh, James Kwok. So uh, in this session, we are going to have four papers. So the first paper will be presented by Alp uh, from EPFL. So thank you, James, for the introduction. Uh, I'm Alp Yourself from EPFL. And today I'm going to talk about the conditional gradient framework for composite convex minimization with applications to some different programming. Uh, this is a joint work with Olivia Farcock, Francesco Locatello, and Volkan Cevher. And in this work, uh, we focus on the com uh, convex composite programming template, but this formulation is slightly different than the conventional one, because here we also enforce the problem domain that we denote by calligraphic X to be a convex and compact set. Uh, and apart from that, we have this uh, composite objective, which can be written as some of the two terms, the smooth term F and the non-smooth term G. And the non-smooth term here is also coupled with a linear map A. So this formulation has broad applications because it also covers uh, many important convex optimization templates as, uh, as a special instance. Simple enough, it covers the smooth, uh, non-smooth, and regularized uh, convex optimization problems over a bounded domain. But uh, in addition to that, and more importantly from our perspective, because we want to solve some different programs with this template, uh, it also uh, handles, it can also handle a fine inclusion constraints of the form AX is restricted to some uh, convex set K uh, by choosing the non-smooth part G as a indicator function. And as a result, uh, this formulation also covers this important semdefinite programming formulation. Uh, this is really close to the standard template of SDPs, but here we have this additional uh, constraint on the trace of the decision variable X, which ensures that the problem domain is bounded. So a vast majority of the optimization problems for solving uh, this constraint minimization problem relies on some projection oracle. Unfortunately, this projection uh, oracle uh, can impose an undesirable computational burden on these convex methods. Uh, 
For instance, the generic example here is the minimization of a nuclear norm ball, and in this case, the projection would require the, the computation of a full singular value decomposition. And this uh, gives rise to the interest in the conditional gradient type methods, which are also known as the Frank Wolf type methods. Uh, because these methods do not uh, require the projection, and instead they uh, leverage the so called linear minimization oracles, which are arguably cheaper than the projections. And in the same example for the nuclear norm ball, this corresponds to the finding the top singular vectors rather than the whole spectrum. And I will briefly describe how the classical CGM works for minimizing the smooth function over a compact domain. Uh, this classical method requires a single input, the initial estimate x1, and at each iteration, uh, it, it considers the linear approximation of the function at the current estimate xk, and minimizes this linear uh, approximation over this bounded domain. And this, is, this corresponds to the so-called linear minimization oracle, and it gives us one of the extreme points of the compact domain. And the next iterate is simply constructed as a convex combination of the current iterate and the, uh, this extreme point that this atom that uh, at linear, minimization, linear minimization oracle gives. Since this is a convex combination, it, it's directly uh, feasible and the method do not require an additional projection step. Uh, unfortunately, this method does not work with uh, non-smooth functions or the composite uh, objective uh, composite formulation that I've sh uh, shown in the beginning of my talk. Uh, and in this work, uh, we present an extension uh, of the CGM type methods for this composite object, uh, composite template. And our framework uh, relies on the smoothing and homotopy under the CGM framework. So let me briefly talk about the Nestor smoothing. So this G beta that I uh, write here uh, serves as a, we, I will call it as smooth approximation of the non-smooth function G. And the intuition is quite simple. Let us assume for now that G is Lipschitz continuous or the dual domain is bounded. Then it's well known that we can write G as the dual of its uh, Fanchel conjugate. Uh, but what happens if we add some small, strongly convex function to, the, to, the, to its functional conjugate before taking it, its dual? Then due to the well-known duality between the strong convex and the uh, smoothness, G beta will be one over beta smooth. And in his seminal work, uh, Smooth Minimization of Non-Smooth Functions, Nestor shows that if G has dual bounded domain, then this envelope property uh, this envelope property holds. And this property simply says that if beta is small enough, G beta will serve as a good approximation of uh, the non smooth term G. Well, I'm for, uh, I mean, a vast majority of the methods that rely on the Nestor smoothing actually directly relies on this uh, bounded dual domain assumption. Unfortunately, this case is not enough for our purpose because as in the beginning of my talk, I indicated that we want to solve some different programs, so we need to choose G also as an indicator function. But the indicator functions are not Lipschitz continuous. But let's have a quick look what happens if we try to smooth like with the same steps an indicator function. And for this case, I will simply um, consider the simple case where the set K is a singleton of the vector B. So this enforces AX equal to B type constraints. And in this case, it's easy to see that the Fanchel conjugate is just the inner product between B and Y. And the, and the smooth approximation G beta is simply this one over two beta, uh, AX minus B norm squared. So this is actually a penalty function. And like uh, as beta gets smaller, the, this part becomes more important in the composite objective if we sum this with the smooth part F. And the same applies uh, for AX, for the general case AX is restricted to some cat set K. Uh, it will be simply replaced, this AX minus B Euclidean norm squared will be simply replaced by the distance of AX to the set K. Now we are actually ready to uh, design our algorithm, but before going to there, I would like to briefly mention two of the related works. 
uh, in the paper, we have two distinct pages uh, for compar comparison with the related work, but here, due to the time limit, I will simply mention two of them. So the first one is uh, by Lan, and in his work, uh, Lan uh, generalizes this uh, conditional gradient method for non-smooth problems, also using the Nestor smoothing and the homotopy in our sense, uh, but his work directly assumes this bundleness of the dual domain, so it cannot handle the uh, indicator functions because it's not of also the purpose in the non-smooth optimization. Um, so the analysis is going to be different for our case. And the second one is Nestor's uh, conditional gradient method, where he uh, generalizes the conditional gradient method for this composite minimization problem. But in the beginning of my talk, as I indicated, this formulation is different than ours because the minimization here is the, in the domain of the non-smooth pack G. On the, uh, on the other hand, we have this additional uh, bounded domain constraint X, and his method relies on this modified uh, linear minimization oracle, which also has the non-smooth part. And if we also add our constraint here, then this sub-problem would be, uh, become as difficult as uh, the original problem, uh, problem to solve. Now, uh, I will simply design the algorithm. The algorithm extension is quite simple. We simply replace uh, the gradient uh, term in the conditional gradient method with the gradient of the smooth approximation. So the smooth approximation of the composite function is defined as the smooth part plus the smooth approximation of the non-smooth part. So it's easy to take the gradient of it. So the gradient will be the sum of the gradient of the smooth part plus A transpose, the argument of this uh, maximization sub-problem. And it's easy to see that this is actually prox uh, of the financial conjugate of G. And for notational convention, I will use model decomposition here to write it in, form, in the form of prox of G. And the method uh, itself is quite simple. Uh, it simply replaces this gradient here with this, uh, sorry. So the, it simply replaces the gradient here with the gradient of the smooth approximation. And by homotopy, I mean like we update the smoothing parameter beta k at each iteration with the rate one over square root of k, which comes from the analysis. And this algorithm that we call as homotopy CGM satisfies this bound on the smooth, uh, smooth approximation of the, uh, of the so ob smooth objective residue. Uh, and we can directly see two terms, two sublinearly decreasing terms here. The first one uh, converges with one over k rate that comes from the smooth part. And the second one comes from uh, the non-smooth part and converges with one over square root of k rate. Uh, but one important thing is here is that this does not directly uh, show the objective residual. This is the residual in the smoothed objective. So uh, from here, the analysis goes in two different ways. The first part directly relies on the this envelope property, and this can be taught as a simple extension of what uh, Lam did in his work. Uh, and here, uh, from, the, from here, we simply add this additional term here, and we get the overall bound on the F minus F star uh, uh, under the assumption that G has dual bounded domain, or equivalently G, has LG, G is LG Lipschitz continuous. And in this case, we can even um, so this beta zero is the initial uh, smoothing parameter. So in this case, we can even uh, minimize this uh, constant term here. So we can minimize this uh, two terms with respect to beta zero to choose beta zero from the theory. And we can get rid of the uh, tuning parameter. But the more important part for us is the case where G is also an indicator function. In this case, the analysis relies on the Lagrange saddle point formulation, and we also need to assume the, that strong duality holds. And in this case, we show two bounds, uh, one in the objective residual, which converges with one over square root of k rate, and the other one is in the feasibility gap, which is also converging with one over square root of k rate. Uh, and uh, here, y star denotes any dual solution, so we can simply take the small, uh, the minimum norm dual solution. So there's this additional assumption that there is a bounded solution uh, for the dual problem. 
And here, one important thing to underline is that this method uh, it does not directly provide us the provide us a feasible solution, uh, feasible iterates estimates, but it converts uh, asymptotically to a feasible uh, point, as indicated by this convergence of the feasibility gap. And we also have similar guarantees with the same rates uh, under the inexact oracle calls with additive and multiplicative error. This is uh, important, especially in CGM type methods for solving matrix factorization problems, so also for same different programs, because there, uh, it's easy to approximate the top singular vectors, but it's not easy to compute them ex uh, in the exact sense. And now, uh, I would like to highlight the flexibility of our uh, framework by just considering this, uh, this uh, quite general optimization template. So let us, let us assume that we are trying to minimize the composite function fx plus gax uh, in the intersection of two uh, compact domains, x1 and x2. And we have two types of affine inclusion constraints, bx minus b in some set k and cx minus c in some sets s. But let us suppose that the linear minimization oracle of the intersection of x1 and x2 is difficult to compute but the linear minimization oracle of x1 and x2 are easy to compute separately. And let's, let us also assume that the projection onto S is difficult, but we can simply use uh, linear minimization of oracle of uh, this set S. So the importance of handling the affine inclusion constraints, now we can add uh, some, introduce some select variables uh, and uh, simply disentangle the difficulty of, the, of these oracles in the product space, which is also known as convex splitting. So now, by introducing these uh, select variables, it's easy to show, it's easy to see actually that this problem uh, is actually a special instance of the problem template in, of our talk in the outer space of x1, x2, and s. So the algorithm that we have presented uh, leverages this uh, separate oracles, uh, individual oracles, and can benefit from, uh, from this convex splitting. So now I would like to present some numerical examples. Uh, the first one is the clustering for example of formulation, uh, formulation from Pang and Wei. Uh, and here we have this, uh, been, so this is in the class, this uh, same different program template in the, that I've presented in the beginning of my talk. And we simply use the test setup, which is published online by Mixon et al. They have, their test setup uh, has, uh, is composed of three parts, pre-processing, optimization, and post-processing. Uh, we keep pre-processing and the post-processing parts intact. We simply replace their SDP solver with our homotopy CGM and uh, see the convergence uh, characteristics of our methods. And here I present three plots. The first plot shows the convergence in the objective residual. Uh, and the second plot shows the convergence in the feasibility gap. And it's uh, easy to see that both, uh, both of these plots are actually converging with one over square root of k rate as uh, driven by the theory. And the last plot uh, shows the misclassification rates uh, observed. And this uh, red dashed line corresponds to the value uh, reported by Mixon et al. in their paper uh, that's acquired by solving the same different program by high, uh, to a high accuracy. And as expected, we also get the same rate uh, asymptotically. But it's also uh, an important observation that uh, somewhat low or medium accuracy solution of the optimization problem can actually result in higher, mis uh, I mean, better improved misclassification rate in these problems. And we also have some image in painting uh, experiments where we uh, want to highlight the flexibility of our algorithm. And so we solve two different uh, minimization problems for this. So the t test setup is, uh, as follows, we have this uh, original image, which is low rank, and there are some missing pixels, and on top, we have also added some uh, salt and pepper noise. 
So we can consider two types of minimization. The first one is in the PCA form. So it, it minimizes the least squares loss in the, under the nuclear norm constraint and additional pixel bounds constraint. And we can also replace this with L1, uh, L1 norm in our uh, framework. Sorry. And the, uh, and the quality of the image observed with the L2 norm uh, is, has PSNR 21. And with L1 norm, we can improve this about 5 dB in the PSNR. And this, uh, we simply did this experiment to highlight the, that flexibility of the method actually is important in the application side. And in conclusion, in this talk, I've presented the uh, extension of CGM framework that preserves the simplicity of the classical method and can also apply for the composite problems with uh, applications in the same definite programming. And it also covers the classical CGM as a special instance, also as the non-smooth CGM as a classical instance. And uh, it's the same method that applies for the regularized problems and also for the uh, uh, problems with affine inclusion constraints. And thank you for your attention. Uh, I, I'll be happy to answer your questions if you have one, any. So we have time for some questions. Hey, the, thanks for the talk. So uh, as I understand, because you fix your tolerance, your smoothing sequence, you can in practice not do better than that one over a square root of key, so it's it's not a it's a worst case scenario, but it's also a best case scenario. Uh, could you, instead of fixing in advance, uh, decide how much smoothing you're going to do depending on how much progress you do on the Frank Wolf algorithm, for example? Uh, yeah, right. So we, that's right. That it's also the best case. This is also shown in the experiments actually observed. Uh, in another sense, we are trying to improve it, and actually we have some uh, unpublished work. Rather than uh, changing the way we in, uh, update beta k, the smoothing parameter, we actually use a dual update, which corresponds to the uh, change of the dual variable, uh, the center point of the proximity function. And in practice, it works much better at, uh, if the problem is easier. Like, if the problem is easy, it can work much faster. Um, and I can also share the details offline, because it's unpublished. Thanks. Thanks. Let's thank the speaker again. So the next talk will be presented by Thomas from INRIA. So hello everyone, I'm Thomas from Inria, a PhD student, and I'm going to talk to you today about how to do randomized linear minimization oracle in the setting of Frank Wolf. Uh, so this is joint work with Fabian Pedregosa and my advisor, Alexandre Spremont. So um, Frank Wolf method, our first order method to solve this ubiquitous uh, constraint minimization, pro minimization problem. My function f is a uh, is a convex, we add some mild regularity assumption like L smoothness, also sometimes a strong convexity. And my constraint, constraint set is a convex hull of a set of atoms. So this atom, it can be finite, uh, like the L1 ball, or infinite, like the, the trace norm. Um, so first order method, they construct a sequence of uh, iterates that, uh, that converge toward a solution to that problem. And um, using only information about the uh, function value and the gradient of the, fu of the function. Um, so if you do projected gradient descent, you follow the, the steepest direction, and then you project back onto the set M. Um, the, the, the Frank Wolf method, on the contrary, what they do is that they always kept iterates as a convex combination of atoms of A. And um, choosing the best atoms for the update requires, in fact, only a sublinear problem. Recently, it has regained some interest because um, each iterate is a sparse convex combination of the atom. And this is good because, for, for instance, for interpretability, for compression, compression. it is also projection-free, projection-free, um, because you do not project. <laughs> 
and uh, it's, it's versatile and scalable. Scalable because um, it only requires uh, linear minim minimization sh uh, steps, which are themselves, uh, themselves scalable. And uh, versatile because if you change your function or your constraint set, all you change is a linear minimization oracle. And finally, it comes with uh, theoretical guarantees. And in particular, there exist uh, linear variants. Uh, there, is, there exist variants for which there is linear convergence. But you have to add some uh, other assumption on the function and the constraint set. So let me do a quick reminder of Frank Wolf. So here you see your, in yellow the level curve of your function. In blue, the border of uh, your constraint set. The red dots are the atom. And uh, X star is a, un, is a constraint optimum we want to, we want to, to, to go to. So uh, you, you start from a point X0, then you compute uh, the opposite of the gradient. You would like to follow this direction, but Frank Wolf d does update uh, at each iteration. It only uh, does a convex combination of the current iterate and an, and an atom. But then you have to choose this atom. And to choose this, this atom, um, this is defined like uh, Yes. So this, um, each atom, in fact, defines a direction. I can go this way, this way, oof, this way, this way, this way. But then you have to choose the best direction, and choosing the best, the best direction is just doing the, uh, finding the, uh, the segment that is best aligned with the opposite of the gradient. And so you, you, you do an argmax over all the atom. Once you've done, you find the, the best one, or it can be approximate also, when you find the best one, then you update your next iterate along this segment. So the, what we want to do today is, is, it, is to say, okay, is it possible to, uh, to not to, to find the best one, but to look for the, for the best uh, vertex among like, uh, a random subset at each iteration? Im imagine now I, I am at iteration. Yes, so we want to do that. And, how we can do that, it's very, very simple. Uh, we change, uh, so, so far the linear minimization oracle is an argmax over the whole uh, atomic domain. Uh, now we say at iteration t, I subsample this domain, so I have A of t, I randomly, I, I sample uniformly randomly, and then I, I do the, what we, uh, a randomized linear minimization oracle, and I search for uh, what we, we call before like the uh, Frank Wolf vertex, I search it only on a subset of the, of the atoms. Um, so it fits uh, very simply in the Vanilla Frank Wolf algorithm. And, and the immediate advantage of that is that now you control the cost of your linear minimization oracle. You control it through the, the amount of uh, subsampling you do at each iteration. So that is controlled by the size of A of T. Um, but you have also an immediate drawback, is that you lost um, the Frank Wolf dual gap. So what is the Frank Wolf dual gap? Before, when you do the full linear minimization oracle, um, this gave you, in fact, a lower, an upper bound on the, on the dual gap. So, and, and this comes simply from the fact that the function is convex and uh, lower bounded by uh, its linear approximation. Um, now, if I subsample, uh, this is not true anymore. So we cannot use... Uh, uh, this way to, to stop the algorithm. Um, but also, let's understand why it could be interesting in practice. Um, so consider a simple example of the lasso. In the lasso, uh, your atomic set is just plus or minus the basis vectors. Uh, if I subsample, I can subsample in a way I take plus or minus the basis vector on a subset of coordinates. Now, if I look at my, at my linear minimization oracle, which was how to choose a vertex and how to choose a direction, um, the x of t, I, I, do not really, I do not care, it does not vary. And we see that we only need to, to, to perform that, we only need to compute the gradient on a sub-batch of, of its coordinate. So provided that you can compute uh, the gradient on a sub-batch of coordinate without computing the full grad gradient, this will really lead in a, in a cheapest iteration, in a, in iteration that are cheaper. Um, so this is, lasso is simple, but there are more general family, uh, family of, uh, of penalization for which you have the same behavior, like latent group norm family. Um, so first thing, um, randomizing is not doing approximate line, uh, linear minimization oracle. So 
uh, as I said before, they are multiplicative or, multiplicative or um, uh, approximate or uh, additive approximate uh, linear minimization oracle. But the thing is that they compare compare the compare the um, the, the vertex they have with the one that they, that they will deterministic, deterministically get uh, looking at all the atoms. That's not what uh, what we do. Also, there is a block coordinate from Wolf, but in block coordinate from Wolf, they assume product uh, decomposability of the domain, and uh, which we do not assume. And also, what do they do is that at each iteration, in instead of computing the LMO on the full uh, set M, uh, which is a product of uh, M1 and Mn, they uh, compute an LMO on, the, on one, uh, one of them and update the iterate on one of them. Um, Finally, the results randomized from Kolf uh, in this way was already proposed by Frandi in the case of the L1 ball. They did not extend it to uh, to more general uh, constraint set, and also they did not extend it to linear variants of Frank Wolf, uh, to linearly convergent variants of Frank Wolf. Um, so, to, so to solve this, this problem of uh, of extending it to linear convergence, uh, linearly variant convergence of Frank Wolf. Um, we focus on the away from Kolf and how can we subsample in this algorithm. So I just remind you, and after there is going to be a drawing, I remind you what is away from Kolf. Um, from a higher perspective, away from, um, at each iteration, away from Kolf proposes two possible uh, update directions. So one um, the, the, is a classical from Kolf uh, update direction, the one we saw before on the Vanilla from Kolf. And the second one is called the away direction. So away direction, in fact, when you have your, you take your current iterate, it is a sparse combination of atoms, and these atoms that form the, the sparse combination, you call it the active set. And the active set, in fact, um, can be used to to define update update direction, which allow easily to. Uh, Wait, no. It allows to uh, define a descent, uh, update direction for which it is e that is that are easy to follow, and for which we can easily stay in the in the constraint, constraint set M. Uh, and also, if you want linear uh, theoretical linear conver convergence, you need you need F to be strongly convex, and the atomic set to be finite. Um, so. Just a drawing to, to explain what I just said. So same same thing. Uh, my level curve, my um, my constraint set. So now I, I have my um, my iterate, my, the opposite of the gradient, and the big red dots. These are the the atom that, that forms the convex uh, li, li, uh, combination of x zero. And what we can do is that we can remark that uh, if I follow this direction. I have a known, and I, I, I can follow it uh, up. I can follow it without leaving the constraint set M. But it defines there are three possible directions: this one, this one, this one, and this step here is just about finding the best one. So the best one is the update direction that is uh, most correlated with the opposite of the gradient. Um, so here, this is a randomized by Frank Wolf, but the away direction, we do not do any uh, subsampling because, for two reasons, because uh, S of T is naturally uh, not going to be a, a, a huge set, and uh, also because we, we we keep the representation of S of T, so it will be uh, some kind of a waste not to fully use it. So, uh, in drawing what I've just said, we pick the best, uh, the best one, it defines the direction, and this is a, a way direction. So we keep in mind, and, and after, we are going to choose between uh, the away direction and the random frog wolf direction. So now, uh, I'm, I'm going to explain how to subsample um, uh, the random, uh, the random frog wolf direction but in the context of away step. So it's not going to be the same as before. We're not going to take uh, any uh, subset of the atom. We're going to uh, require the, sub the subset on which we compute the linear minimization oracle to be a superset of my active set S of T. So uh, my gradient, 
my s of t, and then no, I'm, go I'm not going to, I'm going to subsample on, on the remaining atoms. So I take a random subset, and then I perform my, my linear minimization oracle. And uh, this gives us like a, a Frank Wolf vertex, and also uh, the Frank Wolf, uh, the Frank Wolf direction. And uh, What, uh, and then, remember, we have the away direction, and then we, we choose between away and, uh, and uh, Frank Wolf, the one that is most correlated with the gradient, and here it corresponds to the away, uh, uh, to the Frank Wolf direction. And then we do exact line search, and, uh, and uh, it ends. So now in theory, what, do we, what kind of rate do we get? Um, so eta is a, is a sampling parameter that monitors the amount of subsampling you do at each iteration. Um, So first important thing you have for for randomized variant you have a similar um, convergence rate um, than their deterministic counterpart. So for Frank Wolf, you, we have a sublinear convergence rate. Um, we have the same for randomized Frank Wolf, but in expectation. Remark that um, if we assume that the cost of the randomized LMO is proportional to the amount of subsampling eta. Uh, in fact, there is no loss in doing a randomized Frank Wolf, but also no gain from a theoretical perspective. Um, if we look also at the, at the rates we get for a randomized away Frank Wolf, um, so away Frank Wolf, so remind that uh, the function f has to be strongly convex and the uh, constraint set has to be uh, a polytope. Um, So we have a, a linear convergence rate for away Frank Wolf, and we have this, a, a similar uh, linear convergence for random away Frank Wolf. But here, with a with a factor of eta square, that is uh, that makes it worse in in theory. And the reason also is that because um, the proof are, are somehow quite conservative. Um, okay, but okay, it's it's, uh, it's it's not clear if there is a theoretical gain in uh, in if there is a gain in theory, but do we have a gain in, uh, in practice? So on the right panel, it's a result about the support, but I will not go over it now. And um, on, the, on, the left, on the left panel for me, um, no, for you, so, uh, <laughs> uh, if you compare the, the, con the convergence, it appears that random Frank Wolf perform, uh, does not perform better than Frank Wolf on, on the top. But here, like the the cost of doing randomized uh, Frank Wolf is like 20 times less than doing uh, an iteration of Frank Wolf. Sorry, I forget to tell you what is the problem. So we just consider like a quadratic loss with um, a constraint set, uh, with the L1 ball as a constraint set. But so comparing in terms of number it of iteration is not a, a good thing to do. And if we remember what we said from uh, about uh, the, the lasso problem, Uh, the cost of the LMO is driven by the, the computation of the gradient. And so, uh, and in doing a randomized uh, linear minimization oracle, um, it, it, it is driven, driven by the cost of computing the gradient on a, on a sub subset of its coordinates. So now if on the x abscess, uh, abscess we, we count the, the number of, of coefficients of the gradient that have been computed, we see that random Frank Wolf uh, perform uh, perform uh, much better. We have the same kind of rate uh, of result for away from Wolf with a surprising uh, plot that, that shows that even if we compare in terms of iteration random away from Wolf with away from Wolf, it performs better. Um, so one possible explanation of that is that doing randomized away from Wolf, it biases the algorithm toward doing more away step. So this has two impacts. First, it, uh, it It, it, um, it, it, it force the, the algorithm to be even sparser, uh, the iterate to be even sparser in the convex combination of atoms. And also, um, it, it tells the algorithm to, to, to do a Frank Wolf direction step only when this direction is very good. Uh, and also, when we compare in terms of number of coefficients of the gradient, uh, there is some gain. There is a, an important gain. Um, so the take-home message first is that from a theoretical point, point of view, there is the similar uh, rate of convergence. Uh, in some cases, there is a practical speed-up, 
And this case, in fact, corresponds to situation in which uh, subsampling, when you, you group the atoms, they form a subspace, and then uh, doing the randomized linear minimization oracle requires only to compute the gradient on the, on the, on the sub batch of coordinates. So, so this leads to, to, to variants of Frankel that looks like block coordinate descent. Um, and future work is like to develop efficient subsample linear minimization oracle in other contexts than the one we, we just said before. And uh, as a re reviewer uh, told us, like maybe to, to, uh, to have like non-uniform uh, subsampling strategies. So thank you for your attention and if you have any questions. So we have time for some questions. So, so in fact, do you have uh, convergence results in terms of the time? Ah, yes, but uh, so I have not on the presentation, but on the paper, I show like in the streaming model that uh, it, we have the same, uh, we have the same, um, uh, we have the same uh, kind of uh, behaviors. But I needed to introduce streaming model, so uh, it's not. It's on the paper and on the on the poster, I think. Thank you. So uh, let's thank the speaker again. So the next talk will be presented by Francesco from ETH. Hi, uh, thank you very much. I'm super happy to be here and, and to talk about our recent work on matching pursuit and coordinate descent. This is joint work uh, with Anand, Pranit, my advisors, Gunnar and Bernard, and Sebastian and Martin. So uh, this paper is really about the connection between matching pursuit and coordinate descent. So, uh, we started by proving a new affine variance of linear and linear rates for matching pursuit. And, and then we started thinking uh, that actually coordinate descent is, can be seen as a special case of matching pursuit. And this new analysis that we do for matching pursuit is uh, deeply inspired by the convergence of coordinate descent. On the other hand, you know, coordinate descent has a much more rich literature uh, in optimization. And so, uh, we really exploit this connection to kind of get the best of both worlds. So on the one hand, we can prove tighter rates for coordinate descent with global Lipschitz constant using our new analysis of matching pursuit. And on the other hand, we can use the literature of coordinate descent and prove new rates for random pursuit and accelerate matching and random pursuit. And now since we have a proof for accelerated matching pursuit, we can also accelerate steepest coordinate descent. So, just a quick recap for what's matching pursuit. So matching pursuit minimizes a convex function over a linear combination of an atom set. So it's very similar setup to Frank Wolf, but the only difference is that now uh, we don't minimize over the convex hull of the atoms, but uh, over the whole space. And then the algorithm uh, looks a lot like Frank Wolf. So you query the linear minimization oracle and the linear minimization oracle just gives you a vertex of the convex hull of the atoms. And the linear minimization oracle, as we saw, is just minimizing a linearization of the function. And then we take a step. And now since we are minimizing over the linear span and not in the convex hull anymore, then we simply take uh, a linear step, doing line search on the quadratic upper bound. And one advantage of matching pursuit is that uh, you can, as in Frank Wolf, maintain a representation of the iterate as a sparse combination of your atom set. So, uh, the first interesting thing to notice is that actually, you know, when the atom set contains a basis for the ambient space, then the minimization of the function in the matching pursuit sense is equivalent to just doing this unconstrained minimization in the ambient space. And if the atom set is the L1 ball, then uh, matching pursuit is uh, performed the exact same steps and as steepest coordinate descent because each iteration we query the linear minimization oracle and we find the steepest atom which in this case will be a coordinate and then we take a step in that direction and interesting also when the atom set is the l2 ball 
matching pursuit becomes perfectly equivalent to gradient descent in the sense that they perform the exact same steps. Uh, an interesting thing about matching pursuit, which is different than other uh, first order optimization algorithms, is that uh, it's actually a fine invariant, as Frank Wall is. is. And the reason is because uh, you introduce this, uh, the atom set in the optimization problem. So a fine invariant means that uh, your algorithm is invariant under a fine transformation. So if I uh, skew the space, for example, here, I'm, I'm reducing this direction by half. And then the, you know, I'm not making the optimization problem harder, so the algorithm should still perform the same steps. And this is not the case for gradient descent, because as you can see, uh, the gradient direction changes. And uh, it's not the case for projected gradient descent, while it's for frank -Wolf. And since matching pursuit kind of takes a frank -Wolf step, uh, but unconstrained, then also matching pursuit is a fine invariant. And really the key difference is that uh, the basis of the space is part of the optimization problem. So whenever you change the basis, then you also your atom set is gonna change, and then everything remains uh, invariant. And so we use this to uh, propose a different notion of curvature, uh, which is again a fine invariant. So we, we measure everything uh, with the atomic norm, uh, which is an affine invariant norm. And, and this curvature constant, uh, as the one that's used in Frank Wolf, uh, connect together the geometry of the function and of the optimization domain, in particular the atom set. And then uh, we show the usual uh, sublinear and, and linear rates, and we assume that uh, the function is smooth with respect to uh, this affine invariant smoothness notion. And we also define a, a similar uh, affine invariant strong convexity notion. And, and we measure, again, the level set radius with the atomic norm, so all the rates is affine invariant. And now we can say, you know, uh, L1 ball is a special case. And, and so our rate recovers rates for coordinate descent. But then since we measure everything uh, with the atomic norm, we can show that uh, our, our rates are, can be tighter than other rates that were previously published. And using the definition of inexact oracle, uh, we can also prove rates for random pursuit. So basically what we do, the algorithm is essentially the same. The only difference is that we don't query the LMO at all. We just sample a random atom. And then the proof remains exactly the same. And the only thing that we do is to measure how worse can a random direction be with respect to the steepest one. So this on top is the random direction. And uh, the, this dual norm of the gradient is the steepest. And, and then the rate here is the same as before. Only difference is that we use this delta hat as a sort of like approximate oracle. And, but now since this uh, new proof technique uh, is very similar to the one of coordinate descent, we can also accelerate it. And so we propose the accelerated matching pursuit, which uh, is, has the usual like three sequences of iterates, and then we query the LMO to get an atom, uh, we update the iterate sequence XT, and then we sample an atom to update the other iterate sequence. And uh, yesterday there was a talk on accelerated steepest coordinate descent, so I will not talk about uh, what this translates in the coordinate descent case. But then, again, so what we do is to uh, use the classical estimated sequences proof technique. We define the model function, and one iterate sequence minimizes the model. The second iterate sequence minimizes smoothness, and, and then we get the 1 over t square rate. I mean, the critical thing here that's worth to notice is that uh, uh, having an atom set which is not aligned with coordinates introduces some uh, uh, different geometry in the space, and so we need to diskew the space by introducing this and other matrix P and, and the correspondent norm. And for more details, uh, come to the poster. And then uh, we make some very simple experiments just to check that uh, indeed we do get an accelerated rate, and this is just minimizing a quadratic loss function on some synthetic and some real world data, and then we see that, yeah, the accelerated methods are faster than the normal ones, which is good, and so thank you. Come to our poster, and.
time for some questions. Awesome. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. So the last time we were presented by Fabian from Berkeley. Thanks. So I'm going to speak about the, a method that we call adaptive free operator splitting. And this is joint work with Gauthier Gidel from uh, Montreal University. So as my uh, colleagues have already highlighted, the problem of minimizing a smooth trade-off between a smooth and a non-smooth term is ubiquitous in machine learning. And if the smooth term is simple enough that we have access to its proximal operator, then very efficient methods exist already, like uh, proximal gradient descent. However, recently, the desire to encode more complex uh, priors into our problem has led to the development of many other penalties uh, that are more complex and for which we don't have access to its proximal operator. And examples of this are the group lasso with overlap, L1 trend filtering, uh, total variation, isotonic constraints, etc. And now, a key observation of these penalties is that um, despite the fact that we might not have access to its proximal operator, many of this decompose as a sum of terms for which we do have access to its proximal operator. And this is true for all the examples that I highlighted before. And there's a rich literature on how to optimize this method, uh, often referred as proximal splitting methods, where we have classical methods like ADMM or more modern ones like uh, the Gondas view algorithm or generalized forward-backward. And among this vast literature, I'm going to focus on one specific method uh, that was recently proposed by Davis and Yin that's called the three-operator splitting. So the three-operator splitting can solve problems of this form where I have a sum of three terms. The first term is smooth, and I have access to its proximal operator. And the other two can be potentially not smooth, non-smooth, but for which I have access to, its, to the proximal operator. Uh, first, it might be seen a bit limiting that I only have, I, that I only allow for two proximal operators. Uh, but in fact, this is not a limitation because once you have two proximal operators, you can very easily generalize it to an arbitrary number of them. Also, for simplicity in this talk, I will just focus in the formulation with two proximal operators. Uh, so what, how, how does this method look like? Uh, no need to memorize, but I'm putting it here just so you know what I'm talking about. So the method is very simple, fits in a single line. Uh, it iterates on a d-dimensional vector, and it, in, in the iteration, uh, requires to use the projection of the two terms and one evaluation of the gradient, and that's all. Now, as gradient descent, um, there are convergence guarantees for this method uh, as long as the step size is strictly smaller than 2 over L, where L is the Lipschitz constant of the smooth term. But as for gradient descent, in practice, this result is often not very useful because there's often more than an order of magnitude difference between the step size that is allowed by the theory and the step size that performs well in practice. So here I run a very simple experiment uh, using the three operator splitting on a logistic regression plus overlapping group penalty, where I measure the convergence for different step size. Uh, the slowest one is the one over L, and then I keep increasing the step size until I get to 50 over L, which is the, the fastest converging line. So you can see that taking a much larger step size, you can converge much faster. So can we reconcile this these two worlds, where in practice I can go fast by taking a, a big step size, uh, but, I don't, but I lose the convergence guarantees. Is it possible to design a method for which I can prove that it converges, but it allows for a large step size? And the answer is yes. Uh, through a method that we call uh, adaptive three operator splitting, where the main idea is to not fix the step size in advance, but say, OK, we're going to decide the step size at runtime based only on local information of the objective. And for this, we use a 
classical concept in machine learning, which is that of surrogate optimization. Uh, instead of deciding the step size, the, the best step size for our objective, which can be very hard, what we do is to replace our objective by a quadratic surrogate and then choose the step size, the best step size for that quadratic surrogate, which is a much easier problem. So in the algorithm, we start with an optimistic step size, which is typically the one where we started from the previous iteration, and we check whether um, the quadratic surrogate that we constructed, which is a quadratic function that depends on the objective value and on the gradient, whether that quadratic surrogate is an upper bound on our objective function. And if that, it, and if that is true, then we can use that optimistic step size, where the influence on the step size is on the amplitude of that quadratic. And then the rest of the algorithm is the same as the three operator splitting, but using that new step size. So as you can see, this is quite simple to implement. There's no need to have access to global constants of the objective, like the Lipschitz constant. Everything is decided based on local information of the objective. Uh, and the price to pay for this is that now you need to evaluate each time that you check this upper bound condition, it requires to perform two evaluations of the objective function. Although one of them is usually given as a byproduct of the, uh, of the gradient. But of course, the hope is that despite this slightly higher cost per iteration, uh, the fact that you can take much larger step sizes is going to be beneficial in terms of runtime. So coming back to, to my first experiments, if here I choose the adaptive step size, how well does it perform? And it turns out that choosing the step size with this, uh, with the strategy that I just introduced, it often selects the step size close to the one that performs the best in practice. Now, it's nice to have a method that performs well in practice, but it's even better to have a method that performs well and for which you can prove convergence. So. Uh, our second contribution is a new analysis for, uh, for this method that also applies to the three operator splitting. And so the, the analysis of the three operator splitting is quite challenging, and one of the reasons for this is because the algorithm is not feasible. That is, at a given iteration, the objective function uh, can blow up to infinity. So think that one of my proximal terms can be the identity function, and so at a given iterate, I'm not guaranteed to be bounded. And this is an issue because most proofs for gradient descent and proximal gradient descent rely on the fact that uh, the objective function decreases. So this kind of proof techniques a break for this, for this method. So what we do is instead of considering the objective function as a, as a gap function to measure suboptimality, we chose instead to relax this objective function onto a saddle point problem. So using simple uh, Fenchel duality, we transform the original problem into a saddle point problem where we're minimizing not over one variable, but over two variables. And this way, the objective functions that, that's in my saddle point problem has the nice property that now uh, at the iterates, it becomes bounded. I no longer have the problem that it blows to infinity. Uh, and also because of Fenchel duality, I can recover my objective function by maximizing over uh, one of the variables. And also the fact that I have a saddle point problem gives me a suboptimality criterion given by, this, by the definition of saddle point. That is that uh, this expression is smaller than zero only at a saddle point. So this already suggests what's going to be a good suboptimality criterion. And the kind of results that we have are basically the same ones uh, that we can get for the non-adaptive variant, for the variant with a predefined step size, which is sublinear convergence for arbitrary convex functions. If on top of that we assume that one of the proximal terms is Lipschitz, so I can no longer blow to infinity, then we also have sublinear convergence on the objective values. And under uh, additional assumptions, like strong convexity of the smooth term, and smoothness of one of the proximal terms, we can also get linear convergence. 
Now, uh, finally, we run several experiments on this method uh, on many different problems that involve loss functions that are either logistic or least squares and penalties that are either overlapping group last zone, nearly isotonic, total variation, or uh, L1 plus Terrage norm. And what we find out, so uh, the adaptive operator, the, the method that we propose is in orange. So we found out that it often performs much better than the rest. We also see that in practice, it seems to have always a linear convergence rate, although the theory only predicts uh, sublinear. And it's particularly efficient in cases uh, of low regularization, which would be columns one and three, uh, and when the objective is a logistic loss. So in these two plots, this would be the, uh, the plots that have a least squares loss, where the method performs as good as the other. And that makes sense that the advantage is higher for losses that don't have a constant curvature, because if you have a constant curvature, then the advantage of adapting to the local uh, to local information of the objective becomes less important. So it seems that this is more important in logistic regression. Uh, and that's all. Uh, if you have questions, please come to see me at poster 41. So we have time for one question. So, so you guys have a question. So if you have more than thanks for the great talk. Um, I think I misunderstood something. Uh, slide four. Yeah. Your decrease condition isn't Q a uh, majorizing function of f. Sorry. At uh, condition one, f yeah. of x plus, isn't Q a uh, majorizing function of f? Right. So um, it's it's guaranteed to be a majorizing function if you choose your step size small enough. So if your step size is smaller than one over L, then by the properties of L smooth functions, it will minorize. Uh, it, it, this will be verified, right? So th that gives you, for example, that this uh, condition necessarily has a finite determination. It cannot run to infinity, for example. Uh, but the goal is, of course, to try to find a better step one. sizes okay. right, for which that are much larger than your potential one over L. OK, thank you very much. Any more questions? So if not, uh, let's, oh. You had a question? More oh, yeah, yeah, my question is, well, yeah, yeah. So when we have two, more than two penalties, so uh, when you evaluate in each iteration, do you need to evaluate a lot more function evaluations? Right, so when you have more than two penalties, uh, you, you can transform it into a, a problem with only two penalties by basically, as, as I have here, cloning the different variables and then adding uh, a constraint of them to be equal. So in that case, what you're paying is that you're increasing the, dimensional, the dimensionality of your problem. Uh, but it doesn't change the fact, it doesn't change your um, line search condition because the line search condition only depends on your smooth term. Uh, the, it changes in the fact that now you need your vector of coefficients is larger. So thank you. So this concludes this session. So let's thank all the speakers again.